Super funds are keeping you out of housing. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Grab your hashtag, uh, well not Stein, but cheap water and let's check out this article from news.com.au about, well, well the, the political issues surrounding access to superannuation. Now, I would argue the uh, individual responsibility line where people should have access to their own money, to their own earnings as they see fit. People should be able to use their superannuation when they want. They should be able to invest it how they want. They should be able to use it to buy a house. That's not the popular, uh, well, the majority opinion because a lot of people out there are, well, they think they know better than others. You know, super, we need it for the for the plebs, the stupid people, the dummies that, that can't manage their lives. They need paternalistic government to force these rules on people. Now, if you're a bit too paternalistic and don't give your children freedom, are they ever going to learn? Hmm. But anyway, let's, let's check this one out because you've got to remember all the previous generations that got into housing before it skyrocketed, well, they weren't forced to lock away a portion of their money for most of their lives, some of them dying before they even see it. And now you've got calls for super funds to invest in housing, so you're competing with your own money <laughs> to get into housing. That This is just, this is a joke, everyone. This is why when people think housing's going to become more affordable, it's going to crash in Australia, and then you'll be able to jump in with your stacks of cash. Uh, good luck to you guys. I, I can't see it happening. So, Big Super's $75,000 property price hike claim met with skepticism. So are they claiming that Super's going to drive up housing by seventy five grand? Who cares? The issue with housing affordability is getting the deposit together. Serviceability is easy for most people to manage, particularly now when rentals are more expensive. Housing's going to go up, okay? It's not going to come crashing down. 75,000 may seem like a lot now, but if you if it means you get into your property a decade earlier, you're not going to notice it. And then you're going to have that stability. But maybe I put my tinfoil hat on. You want a populace that's more dependent on the state. And the super funds have a complete uh, bias. They, 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 they want to control the money because they can make money off controlling the money. This is the banks, the retail, the unions, all of them in bed there. A claim by the superannuation industry that house prices would jump 75 grand if first home buyers were allowed to tap into their superannuation to help save for a deposit has been branded implausible by economists and slammed by the coalition as self serving. Yeah, exactly. When house prices, or with house prices soaring and home ownership rates sliding, the coalition has proposed first home buyers should be able to withdraw 40% of their superannuation savings up to 50 grand to assist with purchasing a property. Now, this is a very sensible idea. The coalition need to get more people owning homes. We need to have more people owning homes in this country if you want to advocate for a more individual and maybe, uh, well, less government intervention in your lives. If we, if we really have over 9 million Aussies that don't have a 1000 bucks that they can call upon, as we looked at in the past video, no wonder you've got so many people calling for the government to provide housing, the government to provide free dentists, the government to provide this, this, this. Childcare should be free. Everything should be free when they don't realize it's never free. It's just usually future generations paying for it with huge amounts of debt burden placed on them. And I can understand that they're probably insecure, very anxious, and that manifests in their ideological position and their politics. They probably don't even realize what they're doing. We need to get more people that have financial security, even to a tiny extent. Then you shift the Overton window, because otherwise it's going to keep shifting towards, towards uh, left collectivist policies, which I don't think it's controversial to say have been proven time and time and time again to be a worse outcome for the large majority of people. Under the plan, first home buyers would have to later repay the withdrawn amount plus a share of the capital gain made on the property when they sell the house. I mean, this is, 
you're not even getting complete free access to this money. You've got to put it back in there afterwards. So this isn't the ideal. This isn't freeing you from this. And I know people will say, oh, you could do self-managed super funds. You could do this. You could do that. Come on. Not everyone wants to do that. And you can't live in it. I remember there was one lady I went, well, I knew from university. She ended up becoming a project manager working for the government. And she did some dodgy shit with her family super fund. I don't know why she told me this. Where her family super, family trust, whatever, the super fund, invested, self-managed, there we go, I got it eventually, invested in a, a property. And then she had one of her friends on the leases renting it out and she was a housemate with her. So all under the table. So she got a inner city, bloody Brisbane apartment from a parents or family super fund that she could live in. So people work the system. And I mean, there you go, civil servant all the way, huh? Why not just allow people to have access to their money. Wouldn't that be fair? Isn't that what Australia is about? On Tuesday, newly formed superannuation policy and lobby group, Super Members Council, released a new analysis claiming the coalition scheme would hike the price of homes by 9%. Uh, who cares? Okay, we need to stop focusing on the price of homes. There's another article where the Greens are saying, housing isn't affordable uh, for the average Australian. Yeah, the average Australian isn't buying a house. There's a period in your life where you buy the house. Usually, you hopefully, when you're getting, it's setting up, when you're settling down. That nowadays, both of you have to be working to just get in. And if you miss that window, you're kind of screwed. That's the reality of it. A pensioner shouldn't have to be buying a house. They should already have had one. But the problem is, if a if the portion of your money that you would use to save towards buying a house is locked away for your retirement, no wonder it, it all gets pushed back. The pro proposal would add more than 80 grand to the median price in Sydney, 70 to Melbourne, 78 in Brisbane, and 86 in Perth, the modelling claim. Yeah, but how many more people would it get into housing? Who, who gives a shit about this? That doesn't matter. How many more people would it get into housing? That's what we want to see. It's not mentioned, is it? We all desperately want more restraints to own their own home. No, I, I don't think so. I do not think so, honestly. I think that's a bunch of rhetoric that people are spewing, and it's bullshit. No, most people don't. They, they want to keep keep a, you know, a, a renting class there because so many people want to be landlords. Uh, freshly minted Coalition Assistant Minister for Housing, Ownership, Andrew Bragg, rubbished the SMC's report arguing that funds were acting in their own interest rather than that of their members. Yeah, of course they are. There's no competition. Sure, you can move to one fund to the other. whoop de doo But you're forced to pay into it. You're forced to use this system. You're forced to pay them fees. They've got so... If you compare just a, an ETF that pays you a dividend or distribution every month, and what, 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 have, what have I got? I mean, SYI I'm in now, latest one I bought, 0.2% management fee or something, nothing. Compare that to a super fund. Superfund, it's essentially the same bloody product, but they've got all these other regulations and fees and bullshit on top of it, so it costs more. What if you had complete access to your own funds? Would you have it sitting in a super fund or would you chuck it on an exchange managed fee? Now, the one advantage of super is the tax dodge you can do. You can save on tax to get in there. That's, that's the only reason. Uh, super member council's analysis is a desperate self-serving scare campaign against super for housing. Big super wants to keep our super under lock and key so they can charge 30 billion in fees a year. It is like putting Dracula in charge of the blood bank. Brendan Coates, who heads economic policy at independent think tank, the Grattan Institute, labeled the SMC's figures implausible. Now, let, let's just uh, remind, look at a uh, little bit about the... Grattan Institute here will bring up their data sheet I've got. They're a think tank, high quality public policy recommendations for Australia's future. And while they are independent, I'd say they are pretty much establishment, you know, proudly advocated for hard lockdowns and they receive government and large corporation funding. So just, just bear that in mind when you see them mentioned in articles and policies they put forward or research. So... But here they're saying the SMC's figures are implausible. Granted, the relatively small amount many young Australians have accrued in their superannuation savings. So don't even bother. Don't even bother. Or 
the argument that it's going to send housing skyrocketing is, is facetious. Very few people in their 20s and 30s even have 50 grand in super, he said. According to the ATO data, the average account balance for a 30 to 40 year old male is 56 grand. The average female is 46,000. So if you combine that together, together, everyone, that's 100 grand. If you could get into your house at 30 with a 100 grand deposit rather than having to wait a few more years, or even if you can get in earlier in your 20s, in the long run, that's going to be better. What, what, what do we want? We want people stability. We want people owning homes. We want people to be financially independent. Or maybe, maybe when I say we, I'm talking for a minority. Therefore, the maximum amount an average male or female of this cohort could receive under the policy is 22 grand or 18 grand. So 50 grand. Because forget the fantasy about linking housing affordability to average income or average wages. You need two people working now. If you don't like that, tough. That, that's, that the boat has sailed about one, uh, one income households. They're a rarity. That's a luxury. Most people aren't going to make the sacrifices and lower the quality of life to achieve that or earn enough to be able to afford that. Most of us, we need to have two people working. That's the new norm. That's 50 grand a couple could have. A young couple starting on their life could have that extra money to get into a house. Previous generations didn't have super sucking that all away, knocking it away. Maybe even they'll die before they even see it. I'd be very surprised if the price effect was as large as the super members council is implying, because that would be implying that compulsory super itself is suppressing house prices to the tune of 20 or 25%, Mr. Coates said. Oh boy, I mean... (laughs) The Center for Independent Studies, and this is another organization. Let me just bring up their slide here. Now, the CIS are a classical liberal think tank. What's the argument here? You know, promotes free choice, individual liberty, and defense cultural freedom and the open exchange of ideas. Now, as opposed to the, the Grattan Institute, they don't get government funding. They don't get big corporate funding, at least that we know about, but they get, they're privately funded. You can join them. So, hashtag not sponsored. So, that's their chief economist, Peter Tulip, also pulled cold water in the SMC's analysis, but was skeptical that the coalition's policies would significantly bolster home ownership rates. Policy changes like this do not figure as major determinants of housing prices, he said. But does that impact home ownership? If this was coupled with a boost to supply, then maybe you would have the advantageous effect that the coalition is talking about without an adverse effect on affordability. Mr. Coates added that those who needed the greatest assistance to own their own home would receive little benefit from early access to their superannuation. The beneficiaries of the policy are likely to be middle and high income earners who can buy better homes as a result of being able to access their superannuation. And then the, the homes that they wouldn't buy are going to be accessible for other people. I don't think it'll shift the needle much for low-income earners. I mean, that, that's a supply issue. If you want housing for lower-income earners, you need housing to be cheaper. You need to reduce the onerous requirements we have on housing all the time, and we need to increase supply. I mean, it's, it's, let, me, let me bring up um, one of my, what is it, the slide deck I have here on Pillars of the housing market. Okay, we'll bring this up here because there's a few of them that I'd like to discuss. Here we go. Wait, no, we'll bring up the one that shows the the um, orange border. We've got we've got fewer bad loans. You know, everyone was claiming gloom and doom that. As interest rates rose, people would be forced to sell and the housing market would crash. We haven't seen that manifest. You've got migration is skyrocketing. It's returning back to normal. It's not being addressed. You've got also um, construction apocalypse. Our ability to meet that supply that is needed is being destroyed. More and more builders are going under. I would make the argument that that's been partly fueled by the changes to the rules where businesses could trade while insolvent. No one seems to mention that anymore. You've got government support juicing up the housing market. Okay, we've got all of this here. It's not going to change. Home builder, government supports, shared equity. You've got 
the not in my backyard crowd. You've got market competition. 50% of Australians live in these three cities, Melbourne, Brisbane, and Sydney. Australia may be a huge country, but there's a lot of it that's desert where you don't want to live. There's no opportunities. The workers fly and fly out. Can you blame people? That's not going to change. NCC changes. The building code is getting more onerous all the time. People are voting for feel-good policies, which drives up housing prices. We need a cultural shift. And if anything, we're shifting more towards government intervention in our lives. You've got APRA intervention, changing the rules around uh, deposit buffers and, uh, well, not buff deposit buffered, interest rate buffers, which makes it harder for people to get a deposit. You've got family support. People will help people stay in their houses. You've got the FOMO impact of where, sure, a whole lot of houses changed hands during the pandemic, but it's nowhere near a significant amount of the entire stock. So you have a lot of people that are going to be fine, that are going to be fine, that won't, that'll be able to handle it. And then we've got a demographic shift where household sizes are declining, but our houses aren't getting any smaller. If anything, we're building bigger houses now than we did in the past. You've got people living in huge places now. So we need to address all of these issues, and super is only one part of it. The SMC analysis also claimed a couple of 30 years who each withdrew 35 grand from their superannuation would retire with roughly 195,000 less in today's dollars. So who cares? Okay, but you got a house. You're in a house. How many people still have a mortgage when they retire and get access to their super and just throw it in there anyway? Dr. Chulb estimated that the policy would reduce the average annual superannuation balanced by a modest 11,000 by retirement age with the benefits of owning a home offsetting this loss. Yes, there you go. So, everyone, let's have a bit of a chat about this topic. Now, you would not be surprised if ideologically I align more with the policies that the CIS are putting forward than the Grattan Institute here, but it's good to see we've got two sides of an argument put forward both of them, both of them critical of the SMC, which is, you know, I've got to make a title card or an organization card for it, but it's a lobbying group for big super. That, that, that's what we're seeing here. I can't imagine housing becoming cheaper within our lifetime significantly. I can't see it happening. There's so many people there waiting, waiting for it to address. It might stall. You might be able to stall it and get a little bit cheaper, 10 20%. But compared to the growth that we've seen and just the supply and demand, it's going to be a challenge. There's now calls to limit migration numbers here into Australia to address the housing supply issue. If, they, if that can be discussed by the two major parties and become a political issue, then you might have a chance to reduce that one aspect which, aspect which is impacting the supply demands of our housing but then we still need to address supply you'll have other industries and bodies calling for increases in migration to bring over tradies and workers to help address the the uh the demand so we can build the supply that we need and then you've got the universities and the lobbies that are entirely dependent on these sources of students and income it's just crazy so what do you think, everyone? Should people be able to access their super or do we need to be paternalistic and take care of them? Let me know your thoughts and opinions on this one. Take care and I'll see you all next time. Bye for now.